Good morning. Welcome to St. John's Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Steve Craig, and we have a, uh, obviously there's a health uh, emergency. A, a woman outside that we actually know know. She's she was in our youth group, Choki, and she her mother Pauline uh, attended this church, and so she came to St. John's, and she's in a bit of a crisis right now. So there. Are some good people out there that are helping her. We're trying to get her the medical attention that she needs. And uh, so just let's be in prayer for her. Lord, we pray for uh, Choki. We pray for the situation right now as people are coming beside her, giving her the attention and attempting to bring her the help that she needs. We pray that she would be receptive to that, Lord and that we would be able to bring her to the kind of care that she needs and deserves today, Lord. We ask your protection around her in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, and let's open this service with the call to worship and our opening prayer. And Leah, come on over and help us do that. Welcome back from Catalina. She just had a, I think it was, they all told me it was a great time. Yeah. yeah, we had an amazing time. I'm exhausted and a little bit sunburned on my head. It hurt. Anyways, uh, yes, but please, as we enter this time of worship, I'm, I'd love to tell you under the fig tree later, uh, but our call to worship comes from Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when people live together in unity, when forgiveness oils the wheels of relationships when kindness is the currency. Oh, oh yeah, how, um, how very good and pleasant it is when people live together in unity, when understanding is the language that is learned, when issue can be faced honestly. When we find in Jesus no rich or poor, privileged or forgotten, and grudges are washed away by grace, how very good and pleasant it is when we people live together in unity. Join us in the opening prayer. O oh Lord, hear our cry for mercy and healing, faith and hope, unity and love. In this hour of worship, renew our passion to know you, serve you, and follow you as your beloved disciples. To comfort the lonely, to stand with the broken, to give and to forgive, to live in the unity of the Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's stand right now. Let's join Jessica, David, and Moira. Let's worship together in the Lord, keeping uh, our hearts with this young lady outside, praying for her, and also focusing our hearts right now also at the same time in worship with the gift of this community that we've been given. Let's praise the Lord together.
is a good and loving father, mother, parent, creator, source of our life, who sees all our needs, doesn't neglect a single one of us, and will provide for us just what we need. And even in those times when we are in suffering, when we're struggling, when we don't know the way, we don't know what to do, God is with us, and we have to, we are invited to surrender our control to God's, to say it is well, to just hold that space and trust that God can calm all the storms. from oh he is my song let 
the king of my heart be the shadow where i hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song you are good good oh you are good good oh let the king of my Turn to one another right now and let's extend some love. A handshake, a fist bump, a high five. Amen.
Hey. Hello. Oh. Good morning, everybody. Isn't it good to be in church? I'm just going to say that again. It is so good to be in church. My name is Nancy Ashley, and I'm the director of Children and Family Ministries. Um, and I'm pleased to be here today on this beautiful, sunny day. Um, I have a couple of announcements, and then we're going to go to Sunday school. Vacation Bible School is up and running, and if you will notice something new in the narthex, we have our donation board up, and I'll tell you how it works. Kind of similar to previous years, but I'm going to say it anyway. We have items that need to be donated for all kinds of reasons, for snacks, for our um, opening ceremonies, for games, all kinds of things need to be donated, and so we've made little tickets, and you'll see the tickets are turtle buddies. They're turtle buddies because we are diving into friendship with God this, for VBS this year. So take a ticket, find the item number on the clipboard, and then see what it is. Sign your name and phone number, and we will be glad to receive your donations by July 7th or 14th. Both of those dates are marked on the tickets that you take. And with that, um, today is also Vacation Bible School Volunteer Training Luncheon. And so if you have signed up to volunteer for VBS, please join me in the Westminster Room for lunch and uh, some training information. And if you still would like to volunteer but you haven't signed up, that's okay. Come on over and I will receive your volunteer offer gratefully. And so now it's time for Sunday School. Too much weight here. <laughs> we'll get it. Good morning, family. What a beautiful day. What a beautiful day to come and join and gather together and worship our Lord. So let's praise Him. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's just take a moment to prepare our hearts for our holy God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your beautiful gift of forgiveness. In Romans 12, 1 through 2, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Dear Lord, you have called us to be set apart from the world and it is our heart's desire to trust in you and to hold nothing back. Help us to live each day completely surrendered to Jesus, inviting him in to be Lord over every area of our lives. Help us to grow and mature our faith, and be it a faith that expresses itself in obedience. Transform us, Lord, by the power of your spirit. Help us take every thought captive, moment by moment, thoughtfully responding to situations like Jesus would, instead of reacting out of habits. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Help us to be aware of your presence. Remind us that you are always with us and that we are never alone. You are already there in our thoughts. Help us to be aware of that and to seek your counsel. Sometimes we struggle, Lord, with memorizing your word. So help us to bear your word in our hearts so that we may know your heart. And tune our ears to recognize your voice that we may always follow your lead. 
grow as strong and mature and transform our hearts to look more and more like yours. Transform the way we think, the way we speak, and the way we treat each other. So this watching world will see you as our Lord, our Savior, and the one we are following. So Lord, today we are praying for our brothers and sisters that are suffering from illnesses, from death and loss of loved ones, Praise be to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and God of all comfort, who consoles us as we endure the pain and hardships of life. May we draw from his comfort and peace to overflowing that we may share it with others in their struggles. We pray for all those affected by the growing number of weather-related disasters around the world as our earth groans under the weight of our sin and all the wars that are waging around us. Lord, help us not to fear, to focus on you and what you've called us to do here and now. You are in control, and you've given each of us a role. Help us to know and use our gifts and to do the work you've given us joyfully. Lord, we pray now for the young lady outside this morning who needs you today. I believe her name was Choki. Help this child, Lord. She came to your house for help, and you are here. Lord, we pray for unity, unity in our countries, our governments, and in our churches. And let us not feel anxious or hope about when things get crazy. In your word, your servant apostles told us this would happen. It said, in the last days there will be people, scoffers of the faith, who will follow their own ungodly desires. They will cause divisions within your churches, no sign of a spirit in them. They told us to carefully build our faith by praying in the Spirit and staying in the center of your love with open arms as we eagerly await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring us home into eternal life. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Build us strong and resilient. Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before the ages, now and forevermore. Now, won't you all join me with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you again, gracious God, for calling us here to this place and time to open our hearts again to your presence and your work in our lives and in our world. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us afresh through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we want to talk about peace. Actually, for the next two weeks, we want to talk about peace, talk about shalom, 
God's shalom, the wholeness that the Lord desires in all of our relationships, our relationship with God, with one another, with the earth. And as we come to this passage, we're really, in many ways, we're coming to the, one of the central things that Paul wrote his letter about. And he's been building up to this moment in which he names a conflict that is going on within the church in Philippi that he's wanted to talk about probably the entire letter, but now he's going to talk about it. Uh, faced, uh, he's been talking about it in a circuitous way, now he's really directly naming it. And so I decided to break this chapter up into two parts because it really deserves the time. So we're going to take these first three verses, and then we're going to hear what Paul has to say about cultivating shalom and peace in our personal lives, which will also help us do some of the things that Paul's talking about here as well. So let's go ahead and read chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Lord, speak to us through your word. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Iodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I feel like today is just especially a good day for us to talk about the, the anxiety that exists in our culture and also in our relationships and the, you know, that we walk in. It's just part of the air that we breathe. And I do want to talk about that and just for many reasons I want to acknowledge the fact we have a dear young woman outside who actually was a, a part of this church in our youth group. We love Jokey and her mother, uh, Pauline, also a member of this church, so she came here looking for help. So we want to, as we're talking about these things, we also want to be, I think this is just a wonderful way for us to be reminded that there's stuff going on in our lives. I have a cousin and her husband who just got thrown out of the place where they were living, and they're living with us now, this weekend, and so they're in a crisis. Uh, you have your own crisis uh, stuff that's going on in your lives that I, many, most of it I don't know about, I'm sure. But we're aware of the fact that there is anxiety and unpeace in our world. It's part of our daily lives. It's exacerbated by political divisions, right? It's exacerbated by stress in our families, between nations, and we feel it in our own souls as well. So it's so relevant. And I think most of us genuinely want shalom. We want peace. We want that peace that we, as Christians, we believe is truly a gift from God. But how do we achieve that? That is the question. And chapter 4 of Philippians is one of my very favorite chapters because it is so practical. It is so uh, relevant to our lives as Paul talks about this conflict between two prominent women in the church, urging them to settle their differences with the help of the community. And Paul in particular, <laughs> as a recovering, self-righteous, defensive, angry thorn in the side, has a lot of wisdom to share. He knows all about this, and let's just remember, Paul is writing all of this from a prison cell. Right? So the whole letter is being written from a prison cell, and he doesn't even know if he's going to get out alive. So he has plenty of his own stuff as he is thinking about what's happening in Philippi. I want us to think about some of the principles that are raised here in the scriptures and which we can affirm and practice also in our own lives. And these things are being demonstrated by Paul as he is writing this letter. Let's remember, he's been aware of this conflict long before he wrote the letter. He knew about it. And so he's being very intentional in how he is addressing it, how he's talking to the people of the church and to these women. 
So I want to suggest, first of all, one of the things that Paul models for us, which is so important, three things at one time, not easy to do. We, most of us only do them 40% of the time at best. Remain calm, connected, and clear. Calm, connected, and clear. Therefore, my brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. One of the first things that we're tempted to do when we are drawn into a conflict is to become anxious, angry, to lash out, to lose our cool, to turn our backs on peace, and it's easy to disconnect. We've all done it. We disconnect emotionally. So when I say that Paul remains connected, I mean he's being connected to his church emotionally. He's staying connected to them, and you see it in the way he's talking. My beloved, those whom I long for, my joy, my crown. He's kind of building up to what he wants to talk about, but he's doing it in the context of a, of a connection, a deep love connection that he has with them. And he's remaining peaceful, calm, non-anxious, you might say. And all of that I think he's doing as he prepares to be clear about what he truly believes, what he is convicted about as he wants to talk to the church. I feel for Paul, <laughs> even though Paul was not directly involved in this conflict, he probably felt greatly pained by it. I'm sure you might even say he felt very anxious about it. This was a church he cared about very much. It's likely that he was disturbed and that he lost some sleep about what was happening in Philippi. But what Paul practices is calm and connection while being clear about his convictions and what needed to happen. My brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way. And by everything that Paul is saying, we know that he is talking about what he said earlier in the letter, having the humble attitude of Christ, remember, who looked not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. All of those things that Paul talked about earlier in encouraging the church to adopt the mindset and the attitude of Jesus holds true right now as he's talking about this conflict. Paul could have said, hey, you Philippians, what is your problem? I spent all that time starting this church. I even got imprisoned and beaten in the process. And now you're letting this silly argument destroy everything that I put together. But Paul doesn't do that. He lays a foundation of love and care and concern for everyone in the community. And he probably feels, as I say, anxious and frustrated, but he practices peace. He practices this non-anxious presence with them. And it's what Family Systems calls self-differentiation. Is it biblical? Well, I think it's biblical in the same way that gravity is biblical. You know, it's simply true. And when we can stay connected with one another and not anxious and at the same time speak clearly about our true deep convictions while allowing other people to do the same, a lot of good happens. And Paul is really trying to do that right now, even though he's having to do it through a letter. Yes, and he's hundreds, maybe a thousand miles away. So this calm connection and clarity is accompanied by something else, and that is that Paul remembers the power of community. Let's listen to what Paul says now. He says, I urge Iodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women. Notice that Paul's instructions, whether it's to a single person, we don't know if the loyal companion is one person or whether he's talking to the whole church, doesn't really matter, but he's, he's clear about what he wants them to do. And what is that? He wants them to help these women. <laughs> help these women. When there's a conflict between individuals in the church or in a family or in a marriage, often help is needed. 
Yeah, well, Lisa and I were talking about this, and she said, well, that's, that's what I do, <laughs> and that's my job, right? My job is to help people when they're in conflict and to help them come together. And it's also, obviously, the community of God's people as well. So Paul advises that the community help these women to settle their differences, and Paul, I think interestingly enough, but I guess we shouldn't be surprised, you know, but Paul never tells us what it's about. He never tells us what about. We never learn what the conflict was really about. But it really doesn't matter because this isn't about the content of the conflict. It's about the process. It's about how they're coming together. But Paul offers three ways that the community can help. And the first one of these is to model mutual respect. And he does this. Sometimes when one or both parties in a conflict disengage emotionally because of the pain and the anxiety that they're experiencing, it's tempting to draw other people to our side. Whether to speak for us or to argue our case, but Paul will not allow himself to be drawn into the conflict by arguing one side or the other, by taking sides, nor does he say anything about the content, as I said, of the disagreement, which I think is interesting. He's careful to address both of these women by name with equivalent regard. I urge Eodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel. So Paul is recognizing the contribution of both of these women. No surprise, right? <laughs> Let's just pause right there and just say, how about the contribution of women in the church? Okay, this is a primary passage right here. I urge Iodia and Syntyche to agree together in Lord because when these two women disagree, that's going to be a big problem for the church, right? These women have, have the power uh, uh, to rip this church apart. That's how critical of a role they play. And they also have the power to help mend the church as well, which I think is really an awesome, once again, affirmation of the role, the leadership role of women from the dawn of the early church. So he's careful to address them both. And then number four, I would say, is he encourages a mutual effort. Mutual respect implies mutual responsibility. And so Paul says that he wants these women to be of the same mind. Be of the same mind. Ta'auta franeta. Have the same, the same, it comes from right here. The same gut, heart. And he's referring again to something he said earlier. Remember the last time Jesus talked, or Paul talked about being of the same mind? Have the same mind among yourselves, which is yours in who? In Christ Jesus. So the mind he's talking about is the mind of Jesus. And what is the mind of Jesus? Look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have the same mind among yourselves that, was your, that is yours in Christ Jesus. And then he says, who humbled himself, right? Even though he was in the form of God, he humbled himself, taking the form of a servant. That's the controlling image of this whole letter. Jesus humbling from heaven to earth, walking among us, humbling himself even to death on a cross. Being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, Paul said in chapter 2. So by addressing Iodia and Syntyche together and urging them to be of the same mind in the Lord, he's implying that both of them have a role to play in resolving their differences. And that's just a fact. You know, you can forgive and you can be forgiven without reconciliation, but reconciliation cannot happen unless two parties come together and are able to define what they believe about the conflict while staying calm and connected to those with whom they disagree. So both women, as far as Paul is concerned, were under the same obligation to make the first move, you might say. 
The goal is not for one person to say, I'm perfectly ready to accept an apology when it's made. Or for the other to say, I'm perfectly ready to make an apology when I have a hint that it will be accepted. Each has the responsibility, Paul says, to make the first move. It's, it's so much more fun, though, to wait for the other person to make the first move, right? And we stew on it, and we think about it, and we delay. And days and hours and weeks and months and years can go by. When both parties feel the other is in the wrong and no amount of talking it through can break through the mess, sometimes conditional apologies need to be made. Something like, it wasn't my intention to hurt you, but it's obvious that I did. It's obvious that I did hurt you, and will you forgive me? The worst case of conflict is when there's been a breakdown of trust and when there's a feeling or an experience of betrayal. And sadly, sometimes the old trust can't be recovered, and it can take years to rebuild that trust again. Nevertheless, we can still find strength in the Lord to ask forgiveness and to forgive and to set aside bitter bitterness and, in, and to express a basic care and concern for those even with whom we have a deep disagreement. Now, that's why Paul, Paul wants to end by really focusing on this greater good, which as God's people, we are called to do at all times. Help these women, Paul says, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. There's a security and a beautiful uh, grace in that statement. Your names are in the book of life. You're going to be spending a lot of time together, so you might as well finally work this out. I love that. Paul reminds these women in the church that together they have struggled side by side in the work of the gospel, and the word he used there is sunafleo. It's a strong word that means more than just baking cookies for the annual church potluck, though we do need cookies. He wants these women to remember that they are contending against a common, their common adversary, sunafleo. They're laboring together. They're working together. They're striving together for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have a common goal. They're pulling their oars together. They're moving towards the same marker. They have the same passion. Deep down inside, they know it's true. But we will place a priority on our partnership, Paul says, as he said from the very beginning, I thank my God at all times because of your koinonia in the gospel, your sharing, your partnership from the first day until now. So with Paul, we'll choose not to forget that Jesus brought us together to create this beloved community and to freely share the good news of Jesus with the world. Paul speaks about conflict from experience. You know that. <laughs> you know, uh, when he was on his second missionary journey, he and Barnabas were traveling together, and they had this major disagreement about whether to take John Mark with them. John had deserted them at an earlier point, and Paul said, no way. I'm not taking John again. And Barnabas, the son of encouragement, said, let's give him another chance. And Paul said, no, I'm not taking him again. That's it. I'm done. And Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, says their, their disagreement was so sharp that Barnabas said, well, I'm going to take John Mark. And Paul says, well, I'm going to take Silas. And they both went their own separate ways. They, they parted ways. I guess you could say they agreed to disagree. And eventually... Eventually, we do know that John Mark was with Paul in uh, his later years in life, along with Timothy. And so there must have been some res resolution to, to, to that conflict, which we can give thanks for. 
I could tell some other stories about Paul where he lost his temper, blew a fuse, said, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. He said that to someone once who struck him, a guard of the temple, priest. Uh, he lost his temper. He knew what it was to become angry, self-righteous, self-pitying, angry. So we have, a, we have a partner in this process of building peace into our lives. And so perhaps more than anywhere else, it's in the conflict of difficult and strained relationships that we really get to admit our weaknesses and our personal flaws. And it's in the context of difficult relationships that we get to most clearly practice the shalom, the peace, and the humility of Christ, that thing which often we only do about 40% of the time. But Paul says we can grow and learn and practice that peace right here this week. This morning I want us to close our eyes, visualize someone with whom we have experienced difficulties or disagreements or even a spiritual conflict, opposition. Let's ask the Lord, how do you want me to proceed now in this relationship? Please, Lord, glorify yourself in and through the next step that I take. Whether it's a phone call or a letter or an email or a cup of coffee, or Lord, maybe it's just the courage to begin to pray for that person. And if that person doesn't know Christ, Lord, how can my words and my actions be used by you to draw this person closer to yourself. Lord, you've called me to be of help in your community. Lord, help us. Help me to do that by the power of your spirit. Let's continue to be in prayer at this time of silent meditation. together in this prayer response. Let's pray together. King Jesus, help me to see those around me through your gracious eyes. I confess that in my impatience I have spoken or acted harshly and have not promoted peace. Forgive me and help me extend to friends, strangers, and those I find difficult the same grace you have given me. Help me to bless rather than curse, to forgive and to ask forgiveness, to act responsibly and to seek reconciliation. Above all, may I have your mind and heart, caring not just about my own interests, but the interests of others, to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final song of response and praise. Come Christians, join to sing. Moira, thank you so much for playing today. Julie's out sick today. We'll keep her in prayer. And Moira, thank you so much for sharing your gifts with us. Let's stand and sing. That's the blue hymnal number 342.
difference in people's lives physically and even spiritually by your compassion. Then, it's summertime, and summertime means summer nights at St. John's. How many people have been to a summer night at St. John's? Awesome. All right, I hope next time I ask you that question, everybody will raise their hand. It's going to be on Wednesday nights, beginning at 5.30. We're starting just a little bit earlier so that we can I welcome all the parents from our nursery school, but dinner will be served at 6. There's always going to be a fun activity, and it's a barbecue outside under that massive tree. It's a beautiful, beautiful time. We hope you'll come and bring a friend, bring a neighbor. We have lots of neighbors and friends who come to this. I've met so many neighbors uh, in our community through this event, so they already know about it. Just invite them, all right? Just say, I'll come along with you. Maybe they'll invite you. I don't know. It's, it's possible or go the other way around. And then also, just a reminder that the welcome group is happening every Sunday, and it's going to be happening today at 1145 in the Fellowship Hall. That's a casual lunch and discussion for anyone who's new to the church. You might be first-timers, but there are also a lot of folks who keep coming back because it's so great. So Akilah and Priscilla Kim spearhead that as well. We want, to know, want you to know that that's a possibility for you to do. And finally, prayer. We're going to be praying for you right here by the pulpit after the service. Uh, Jim Lamb and Kathy Lucky, uh, our church officers, our spiritual leaders who are going to be praying for you today. We hope that you'll take the opportunity. And I just want to say again, if you're here for the first time or if you have more questions about Jesus, you're not ready to walk down the aisle but you want a conversation, talk to me. I'll take you out for a cup of coffee. And I'd love to hear your story. I'd love to hear more about your life, what you've been through, and to um, have an opportunity to have a conversation. I'm not a scary person. You can sit down with me. We can talk. I'll do a lot of listening, I promise. And so hope you'll take me up on that. All right, now you can stand up. All right. Sanctuary is heating up. It's going to be a warm, uh, warm week, I think. But let's open those side doors, let's go out there, and let's be Jesus' people. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.